Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Welcome to our stories of Pensacola, Florida, the nation's oldest attempted settlement. In our previous three episodes, we talked about the beginnings of exploration of Florida, then the selection of Don Tristan de Luna to head a, an expedition or a task force which was to establish two settlements in North America from which the Spanish might work to literally enclose a defense of the entire continent against other foreign countries. We talked about the arrival here of uh, de Luna with his 1,550 people and how a terrible storm on the fourth night destroyed all of the ships, the supplies, and left the, the, the survivors of that storm literally without, without resource here, and of how next they began to try to locate the Indian settlements, which they knew were here somewhere nearby. And indeed, they had done so. In the last episode, we had talked about the, the move of the cavalry from the Indian village near Pensacola of Nanakapana to the Indian settlement at Coosa, which today would be about, well, where Albertville, Alabama is now. Well, they arrived. Major Del Sao's arrived with Domingo de Santa Domingo, the head of the friars, and they made friends with the chief. And things went well. And finally, after about, oh, a month, when they felt things were going smoothly, uh, Del Sao said, well, now let's take the next step. We want to be sure we are, we're, we're well enough established with these folks that we can finally ask them if we can bring the balance of all of De Luna's people here for the, for the rest of the winter. And so they said, well, the first thing we ought to do is to conduct a mass. We, let's hold a religious service. And so they went to the chief, and the chief said, well, he had no idea what this was, but by, fine, we'll do that. And so picture this, we're out in a, in a clearing there at, the, at Cusa, and the, uh, the Spanish put together what we would today call an altar, like the one, the table, like the in front, and they put a bower of uh, pine boughs over the top, just made it look very nice. And Domingo de Santa Domingo was prepared to, to conduct a mass. Now all of the Spanish soldiers were over here on his right. All of the Indians were seated there on the ground to the left, and the service began. And, and uh, Domingo de San Domingo was a wonderful, wonderful provider. He did an excellent job. Now, as those who know the service well will recognize, there comes a time in that service when the, when the minister must put, a ch put his chalice right in the very center of the altar, and he then moves around and stands in front of it and continues with the liturgy. Well, he did this, and as, as he turned his back, Almost at once, a large worm begins to descend on a tiny web from the bower that was above it. Down, down, down it came. And of course, the Spanish on this side, they were horrified. What, in the, what, should, what should we do? Should we jump and swat it away? Well, they knew that to do that would break the spell of the mass. The Indians on this side were saying, well, this is very interesting. This part, is this part of the show? Well, down, down, down. Down it came, and the worm went right to the very lip of the chalice, and then fell off dead. Well, the Spanish were relieved. The Indians turned to one another and said, well, these folks have powerful magic. This is impressive. Once that was done, and the people shook hands afterward, now Domingo de Santo Domingo and Del Sal said, all right, the time is right. We can, now, we can now approach the chief and ask him if we can bring De Luna's people here. And so they do. And the chief, who was a wily old man, he said, well, I, I figured there was something like this in the offing, but I, I didn't want to bring it up. But did it, now that you say it, that I, I understand. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. We will be happy to host De Luna and his people if, if you will help us. Now, you have no reason to know this, but we have been bothered for a long time by a very nasty group of other Indians who are move, continue to move west out of Georgia and steal our crops, steal our women. They are just nasty people. And right now, we happen to know our, our, uh, our spies tell us that they are on the way here for a raid right now. Now, if you will help us with your thunder sticks and we can drive these people away, then of course, that will be fine. Then you can bring De Luna on. Well now, Del, Del, Major Del Sao's and Domingo de Santa Domingo, they sit down with each other and say, now, what shall we do? If we do that, we'll gain the chief's approval, we bring De Luna. If we, do the, if we don't do it, chances are he won't give us the okay. And if we, well, either way we lose, because if we shoot at some of these other Indians, we may never be able to bring them to the true church. What shall we do? Well, Del Sal says, well, 
We have no choice. If we don't do it, the, the Luna is going, and his people are going to starve. So they say, we'll do it. Well, now you have to picture this. It's a, it's a morning in the late, late uh, fall. They're Indi we're in Indian summer, and the, 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 the temperature and the humidity are just right, and the encampment of the Coosa Indians is on the west side of a stream, a fairly good-sized river, and there's a ford here across which the invading Indians could come. So here is, here is uh, Del Sao's and his soldiers with their, with their thunder sticks, which were arquebus. Now, an arquebus was a huge rifle. It was, it was six to seven feet long, weighed about 60 pounds, and you had to have a, have a tripod to put the barrel in to hold it steady. Now, it was hardly, hardly accurate. If you took a, aim at something directly ahead, you might hit something uh, 75 degrees to the right. But nonetheless, it made a tremendous amount of noise. It fired a, a pellet about, oh, about the size of a billiard ball. Okay, we're all set there on the, on the bank, and here come the Georgia invaders. Del Sao's and his people are crouched down, waiting for them to come. And now as, they re as the Indians are crossing the river, about halfway across through, about up to their waist in water, Del Sao's rises up and he says, fire! And they do. Another miracle in our story. One of those arquebus pellets hits an invading Indian right smack in the chest and kills him. And thus we had probably the shortest war ever fought on North American soil. The Indians, the, the invading Indians were absolutely petrified. They stood there, they didn't know what to do. They quickly surrendered. A treaty was signed on birch bark and the Coosa Indians were just as happy as they could be. Now the chief turns to Del Sao's and Santa Domingo say, all right, you have done your party, you have kept the bargain, you may send for De Luna and bring the people here. And so uh, Del Sao's assigns seven members of the cavalry and they get on their horses and ride off as quickly as they, they of course they've been this route once, now they have a pretty good idea how to, how to travel, do it much more quickly, and they come to Nana Capana. They ride into the outskirts of the little village and there's no one there. There are no Indians, no Spanish, but they finally find a piece of bark tacked against a tree with a little message written on it which says, we feared that you were dead, we ran out of food, we have gone back to Oshus. Well, of course, the, the seven messengers have no, no other choice. They, they take a nap, uh, grab a bite of hardtack, and then start back for Oshus and arrive at the, at the, on the coast. And of course, by now, uh, almost uh, 14 months have passed since the arrival on the coast uh, in August of uh, 1559, and things have gone from bad to worse for the colonists. There have been one or two shipments of supplies from Mexico, but not much. And they have, obviously, they've gotten less and less to eat. People have died. Uh, the children are, are, are terribly malnourished. Everything is going wrong. But now, here come these seven men with good news. And Deluna, of course, Deluna receives, he, he can't believe how lucky he has been finally. And he sees a, a, a ray of hope. And he says, of course, we have to be honest about this, I think. We all, he also probably is still thinking about the family fortune, which is sitting on the bottom of the bay here in the, in the hulls of those ships. But he immediately says, all right, tomorrow morning, 0700, everyone falls out with full field pack. We are ready to march to Cusa. Juan Saran Saavedra, who is a realist and has been all the way through our story, <clears throat> comes to the commander and he says, sir, look at these people. They're starving. They're, 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 there's no way in the world you can ask them to march 200 miles through the, to the wilderness here. They, they'll never do it. The Luna insists, he says, no, we must try. Tomorrow morning, 0700, these others will guide us, we'll go. Well, seven o'clock the next morning comes and about a dozen people turn out. The, uh, uh, Saran is right, the, they are just, the others are just unable to make the march. And so day after day, they sit there, De Luna gives the same order and the same result fastest. So finally he has an idea. He turns to the seven men, the seven uh, cavalrymen, and he said, I want you to go as quickly as you can to Cusa and tell Major Del Sao's to bring the cavalry back, uh, bring a few of the cavalry back here, not all, but a few of them. You want to maintain your position with the Indians, bring some back here so that their horses can help the, the settlers here make the march. And so the seven men get on their horses and as quickly as they can, they get to Cusa. Now, what happens next is something that probably may have happened to you sometime in your life. When you were, when you were a child, you probably well, may, have, may have done it as an adult. You sat at a party and you, you played a game. 
And the game starts with somebody whispering a message to somebody on one side of a group, and he is supposed to pass it to the next, and to the next, and to the next, and to the next. And of course, usually what happens is when it finally reaches the end of 10 or 12 or 14 people, there's no very little resemblance to what started with. And that, unfortunately, is exactly what happened when the seven men reached Major Del Sao's. The message was totally misinterpreted, so instead of sending a few people back, the entire cavalry now marches south and r arrives in Oshus uh, to the dismay of De Luna. But now here you've got the whole group here. And of course, he's, De Luna immediately said, well, with all these additional people, we can make the march better. And Saran Surveyor says, look at them, sir. There's no way because there's, these people are just unable to walk. They're unable to crawl even. And so they sat. And day passes day passes day and things get worse. And finally, we come to Monday, Thursday in the year 1561. Things have gotten so bad. And now for that day, Domingo de Santo Domingo asked de Luna's permission to have a special mass, a celebration, asking God's help to possibly bring some miracle that will, will relieve them. And de Luna, of course, says, yes, indeed, you may do that. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'll call the people together and we will have such a mass. And they do. Well. The, the assembly comes together and they, uh, the uh, friar proceeds, and then he does something very unique. About halfway through his own homily, instead of continuing in his own story, he turns to De Luna and says, Sir, we must look to you. you. So you must do something. I know you've done what you could, but some miracle is necessary. If it does not happen, we are all going to die. And De Luna, the story goes, De Luna literally broke down and cried in front of his group because he, he had done what he could and everything seemed to work against him. Well, the day ended and we come to the following morning. It's now Good Friday. And about 10 o'clock in the morning, three of the young officers got up. They had no reason to do this particularly, but they wandered down to the, to the edge of the bluffs, looked around and looking to the west, here coming up the bay, are six beautiful Spanish galleons with their flags flying, and they're coming right straight for them. Within an hour, the vessels arrive, they land, they drop anchor, and the leader of that vessel comes ashore, and it turns out that he is an old marching buddy, an old fellow soldier of De Luna. His name is Angel Villafagne. And Villafagne comes ashore, and he brings De Luna this message. He said, I have, we, we have got all the food and medicines we could possibly bring. Now, my job here is to, first of all, help your people try to revive, try to restore them, them physically and mentally if we can. But while I'm doing that, I'm to take a survey. And my order is, if after two weeks of such care, I think these people are able to begin again with the uh, mission that was given to you a year and a half ago, fine, then we'll start out. However, if, in my opinion, they can't do that, then I am to put them all aboard these ships and take them back to Mexico. And De Luna said, well, that's, that's eminently fair. By all means, let's do that. And so they proceeded. And the food is brought ashore, the medicines are brought, and for the next, uh, next two weeks, the care, as, as uh, suggested by Villafagna, is rendered. We come then to the end of that two-week period, and uh, De Luna and Villafagna sit down to breakfast, and Villafagna says, old friend, I am sorry. But there is no way that these people can carry forth that mission. They are sick, they are tired, I am going to relieve them all. And De Luna said, well, wait a minute. Wait. Now, suppose I got 25 men who are willing to stay. We've got tools now on board your ship. We could start building as we would have. And Villafania says, okay, well, make it 50. And De Luna does get 50 to agree to stay. And so on a given day, the balance of the group, roughly 800 people, are now rowed out to the vessels, they go on board, and De Luna now is left with, the, with 50 people, and they've got saws and hammers and all the things that go with them, and they start doing the things that one would have imagined they would have done 18 months before. They start to build. And that's where we must leave our story today, and we'll bring up the final chapter shortly.